Hey guys, how you doing? I hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. I wanted to get one last video out. Uh, I won't call them secrets, not tips. This is more just kind of ideas on what I think contribute to a successful season. And just to recap how we did, uh, we did have Champion Loft and Champion and Champion Bird in the club. We had uh, seven club wins, uh, eight club seconds, eight club thirds. Uh, in the combine, we had three first, uh, four seconds, four thirds. We were sixth Champion Bird and seventh Champion Loft in the combine. And, I, you know, I think those are those are excellent results. Uh, I think more important and, and a, a better result is I started the season in the spring with 24 pigeons and I finished with 16. Um, and, and those returns in my area are just phenomenal. Uh, there's people in the combine that lost more birds uh, over the course of the series than I even started with. Um, and I think that's the most successful result. How, how did how did it happen? Uh, a bunch of different things. Obviously, we had good birds, um, but there, there's some other other things I want to talk about. And and I think uh, this is just kind of a general idea that would apply to all pigeon fanciers. But I think if if new fanciers would consider this, I think it would help improve their results. And I, it, it's this uh, first idea is treat every bird like it's worth uh, fifteen thousand dollars. And that fifteen thousand dollar figure, I looked on Gannis. The most expensive offspring that they offered on his website currently is off a bird they have called Wolverine, um, and they list fifteen thousand dollars for direct direct son or daughter off Wolverine. It's a lot of money to spend on a bird, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But if we treated every bird that we had like it was a fifteen thousand dollar pigeon, but we still had to race it, we would make sure it was settled. Uh, safely and, and properly. We would make sure it was healthy. We would make sure it was through the molt before the races started. We would do everything we could, can to train and condition that bird prior to the race if it was worth $15,000. Things I don't like about uh, uh, pigeon racers uh, in general is the idea that the pigeons are just expendable. Um, you know, I'm going to lose a bunch, so I'll breed extras. Uh, you know, the, the, the idea that, oh, the good ones will make it back, um, you know, kind of making up for, coming up with excuses to make up for, for things that, that maybe could be corrected by, by the handler or something the handler did wrong. If we treated every bird like it was 15, worth $15,000, uh, I think, I think we, would, we would be more successful a, a, as a whole. Uh, another idea is, is loft and, and motivation. The birds have to be motivated and they have to want to, come, want to come home. And a lot of that's built in. They like the safety of the loft. They like um, that's where they're fed, and they're they're going to come back to it. I think there's some things we can do as fanciers to 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 increase that that motivation or that desire to be home, and that's just creating a, a good a good a good home life. Um, I know guys that got to go in their loft uh, on basketing with a fishing net to to catch their birds. They're chasing the birds all over, and it and it it's just kind of kind of kind of this chaos. I think one of the biggest stresses in a loft can be the fancier themselves. Um, if if the birds aren't um, in a condition where they're used to the fancier, I I, I think it, it can lead to, to 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 that stress and that overall feeling of the loft kind of being off versus a bird birds that are relaxed in the loft, they're relaxed around the fancier. I I, I strive to to make the birds be uh, relaxed around me, and I do that in a few different ways. Uh, I think one of the biggest is box perches. Um, in my loft, it's just box perches. I think V-perches are more common or, or stick perches, even a little two by two stick. And the birds really prefer the V-perch. They really f prefer that stick perch. Uh, and, and I think the reason they probably prefer it is they have a lot of different air ways they can escape if, uh, you know, the fancier is trying to catch them or, or, you know, I think they just feel safer. A predator, for example, um, if they're on a V-perch, they can go down, they can go up, they can go side to side, they can go out. In a box perch, the only option they have is to come out. Um, and so when I walk in my loft, uh, and, and let's say the birds weren't tame, tame they're going to try to get further away from me in their box. Um, and and overall, just that alone creates kind of an effect in the loft where the birds aren't very flighty. They're just more relaxed and more calm. And and I, I like that, and I think that, that increases the motivation and the overall safety and feel of security in the loft, yeah. training and practice. Uh, pigeon racing isn't hard. If we kind of relate it to a basketball team or a football team, 
practicing. They're going to practice plays over and over and over and over again. They're just going to drill them in practice. So when they get to a game, they'll be able to perform. And I, I look at pigeon racing kind of the same way. It's not complicated. We want the birds to fly from a crate, be released, fly to the loft and trap in. That's it. It's really simple. It's not hard. Um, and so I just drill that over and over in the birds. And I start that in day one. I release them from a crate. They trap in the loft, release them from the crate, trap in the loft. And, you know, my birds before the first race, I, I bet they've probably done that a couple hundred times. They've been released from a crate, they fly and they trap in. And you can go back and look at the videos on how I do that using the tunnel and, and the method I use to train the birds um, does, does a lot to just get the birds tame. I'm really careful when I settle the birds. Um, and that's kind of the training and practice that I think I think uh, if, if you would consider the idea that the pigeon's worth fifteen thousand dollars, and you took more time in settling and more time in training the birds, I think I think you, you you'll have a lot more success. Uh, I, it's so easy for me to crate up the birds because they're used to it. They've done it a bunch of times. I can go in and catch all the birds in two minutes and 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 be out be out the door, uh, or, or in the car driving somewhere. And so I I had uh, you know I had to go thirty miles away to another town up in Yuba City. I three or four times. Um, this year, I would create the birds up and bring them up there. I was going up there anyway. Um, it conserves conserves gas. It's not an extra trip because I was going anyway. I, I bring the birds to soccer practice, even if it's just 10 miles away. I bring the birds and, 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 and bring them on a toss. And I think just getting them familiar with that process of being released from the crate, flying home and trapping in, and also getting used to their surroundings is, is, is huge. Um, and, and so I would encourage uh, definitely new fanciers to, to do that. Um, I, I would give the birds a peanut every night and I hand feed them. Uh, that adds to the birds, you know, being familiar and comfortable around me. When I go into the loft, the birds would come out to the edge of their box and they lean forward looking for their peanut. Um, and and that, that contributes to the overall feel of the loft, how they feel about me in the loft. Uh, and that, that helps on race day when the birds come home. I know guys that got to hide. Um, they got to be away from their loft somewhere else when the birds come home because if they're there, they won't trap in. Uh, again, this, this is just one, one, the peanuts is one thing. I don't overfeed them. I don't put a, I don't put two pounds of peanuts in the hopper. I feed one peanut and I, and I think that's huge. Why we're kind of talking about feed. Uh, early on in the season, I would, I fed 14%. When I first got the birds, they were, they were getting fed, fed a 14% protein ration. Uh, and by the time the races started, I went down to 12%. Uh, when they were molten feathers, I added some chicken pellets in there that were 18% uh, chicken pellet, and I would mix that with the 14% I was feeding. But by the time the races started, I, I fed 12%. Um, how much to feed? I did an, uh, a video on feeding. I'll put that uh, up in one of the corners. You can watch that video. It's just one way to, to figure out how much you should be feeding. But I would break my feeding up. Uh, I fed a third of the ration in the morning and two thirds in, 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 in the evening. And I, I did that pretty much all season uh, and, and, and fed that, that, that 12%. Uh, the only time that I varied from that was uh, basketing. On days when I was basketing on the short races, I, I wouldn't feed. So my first race is like 90 miles. I've got 118 miles up to 130 or something. Those first three races, I wouldn't feed at all on basketing. I feed them regular on Thursday. So a third in the morning, two thirds, two thirds at night. Uh, wouldn't feed them on Friday. They tr they come in, you know, Saturday afternoon, uh, Saturday morning from the race, and 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 they would have pretty much all they want to eat the, the day they return. And I did that pretty much for for all the races. When the races started getting longer, like a, a, maybe around the 200 mile mark, I would start feeding in the morning. The day of basketing, I would feed one third a ration. Um, the longest two or three races at the end of the season, I would feed uh, like two thirds of a ration. And I would, I would do that later in the day on Friday. So I wouldn't feed them first thing Friday morning. I would feed them, you know, for the longer races around noon. The last race, I think I fed at four in the afternoon um, for, that, for that last race. And the longer two or three races uh, at the end of Young Birds, I would also add to that 12% mix uh, sunflower hearts. I'd buy them at Winco. Uh, they're just raw sunflower in the bulk, bulk section. And I would just try to give them an extra, a little bit of extra fat um, for those longer races. Uh, the 300, right before basketing, I give each each pigeon two or three peanuts, um, just just by hand, right before I basketed them up. Uh, it was 
the 300 mile race, it was, uh, I think the temperature was like 20 degrees or something, pretty cold um, at the release point and where they were going to be kind of sleeping most of that night. And so I, I, uh, I, I gave them a little extra. And I, I you know, the 300, I, I think we had the second place bird in the combine. It, I, don't, I don't think that hurt us at all. Um, and I, again, I wanted the, wanted the birds to come back. And, and uh, so that, that's feeding. What else can I say about feed? A grit. I like the all-in-one grits, the Javadi or, or a Versalog. I would give them that to the birds every morning. Every morning I'd, I'd, I'd put it in there unless I was medicating or uh, Thursday and Friday of basketing uh, we, the weekend I was racing, I wouldn't give grit just so they would, they would be a little lighter. The next idea I want to talk about is, is uh, I would buy antibiotics. There's kind of a push out there to be antibiotic free and I totally understand it and it makes perfect sense. I, I think one of the biggest pushes out there for, for that is Frank McLaughlin and, and, and I think, you know, Frank, it's amazing knowledge and he's done amazing things in the sport. and. He's one of the main proponents uh, to be antibiotic free and, and, and it, it does make sense. I don't think it makes sense for a new fancier and, and uh, I'll kind of talk about that. I think Frank, especially Frank, he's imported and exported thousands of pigeons and he's been around pigeons for 40 years or 50 years and he's got great experience. He can walk into a loft and he'll, he can pick out a pigeon that's off. And I think that's, that's kind of, that takes time and a new fancier just, just can't get that done. My very first season um, flying, um, young birds, 2005, I did uh, better than I did this year. Um, it just had a ridiculously phenomenal first year flying. And, and I, I attribute that to two things. The first was I, I medicated. Um, and all the literature and, and even Frank's website early on, he was one of my mentors. I never met him. I don't know him personally, but uh, on his website, he had a, a few things. One of them was called uh, an article he wrote called Health 365. And, and in that, he, and he recommends similar to what David Marks and his vet, uh, he's a, a pigeon vet, what he recommends, Australian pigeon vet recommends the same thing, but he flock treating the birds before the first race to make sure they're clear of canker, coccidiosis, respiratory, uh, worms, any other parasites. You wanna make sure all that stuff and the birds are clear when the races start. And then about every third week, you treat for respiratory and treat for canker alternating weeks. Um, and, and the birds will just be clear. Uh, if you're not going to treat, these pigeon books recommend, these, these veterinarians recommend bringing your birds in to a vet and having a crop flush and a fecal smear done. And my first year, I was just interested. I was soaking up everything I could about, about pigeons, and that's what I did. I went, I brought, I brought uh, three birds over to a vet call. Her name's Jeannie Smith. I don't even know if she's still around, but in 2005, I brought birds to her didn't know anything about it, but she did a crop flush. She did a fecal smear and she said, yeah, the birds look really healthy. You have a mild respiratory issue. I think she prescribed like 14 days of Bay Trail or something. And I did that prior to the races. And when the races started, I had no respiratory issues and my birds did really well. Uh, the other thing I would attribute uh, my success to that first year in, in pigeon racing is, is the molt. And that's something that, that that's huge. I had my birds on lights that first year. Um, 16 hours of light, and and I, I can't remember where I read that, but it was it, uh, just the number that stuck out. And my loft was kind of away from the house. In fact, where the same location it, 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 the loft is that I flew out of this year. Um, and I had three or four extension cords going from my house up to the loft. I had cows in the pasture. And sometime uh, early in June, the, a cow got his foot wrapped around the extension cord and, and broke it. And so I went from 16 hours of light down to down to no light, just the natural natural light, and that triggered the body molt. I didn't know it at the time, didn't pay attention. It was just dumb luck. But when the races started, my birds have gone through a complete body molt. Um, I did have birds missing flights, and and uh, you know again I didn't I didn't know any different. But they were racing against birds that hadn't molted yet, so they were sexually mature and they were just more developed. And I, frankly, I kind of just I killed everybody and and. Not everybody, but most of the fanciers in the club and combine. Uh, you know, we uh, my very first race ever. Uh, didn't first race I'd ever been to. First time I'd ever basketed pigeons. It was firmly, and I won first, second, and third in the club and the combine. It was just crazy. No one could believe it. Everyone was wondering who's helping me and how I how I did so well. The second race I got first and second place. 
third race, I didn't do as good, but I was still in the top 10% and I was in the top 10% in, in all eight races. Um, I think the, the final race, I had uh, the second place bird at the 300 in the, in the club and the combine, and I had average speed. Uh, I won average speed in the combine in, I think, the A race or the B race, and I was like fourth average speed in the, in the second race. I had phenomenal first year of racing pigeons as far as success goes, um, and I attribute that to, the, to, to going to the vet and, and then treating them with the antibiotics and uh, the molt. And that's something, if you want to be successful in pigeons, I think you, you, need to, you need to have control over both those things. They have to be healthy. You have to have them through the molt. If you're not going to bring them to a vet and have them tested, you need to treat, flock treat the birds before the races start to make sure they're clear. And then I would treat a couple times. Um, I think I treated, uh, this year I ended up treating before the races started. I treated for three days after I had the young bird issue, young bird sickness issue. And then I treated for respiratory once, and then I treated for canker. And then right before the 300 that week, I treated for respiratory again. I just wanted the birds to be clear. Um, respiratory is the thing that I'm, I'm the most concerned about. Pigeons, with every wing beat, they, they have a, 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 full, a full breathing cycle. So if a pigeon racing home, flaps, uh, you know, five, five wing beats, has five wing beats a, a second. Um, some, sometimes, you know, so, some things I read said it was a little less. Some said it was a little more than that, like seven or eight times. Uh, but racing home, five, let's say it's five, five wing beats a second. Uh, you do the math, that's five inhales, five exhales. It ends up being like 18,000 breaths an hour uh, flying home. Um, so that's, you know, try to breathe five times a second. <laughs> if, if there's any type of mild respiratory issue in there, it's going to manifest itself and the bird's not going to do as well as if it was clear of any respiratory issue. Um, so that, that's one of the, the, again, going back to the $15,000 pigeon, if that's a $15,000 pigeon, you're going to make sure before you send it to a race that it's clear of canker, clear of respiratory, clear of coxie any of those issues. And you do that either by bringing it to the vet or just by treating it. And uh, early on, vet books, they, they recommend doing that, especially for a new fancer. I would recommend that, that, same, that same thing. I don't want to offend anybody here, but pigeon fanciers as a whole, racing pigeon fanciers as a whole, I think are the most irresponsible pigeon breeders there are, or animal breeders that, 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 are, that are out there. And let me explain why I say that. If Maybe I'm, I'm a breeder of, let's say, German short hair point. I, I have a dog that's just timid, just scared of everything, scared of its own shadow, scared of noises. That's not a dog that I would want to breed from. Um, if I have a, a German short hair pointer that I'm, I'm trying to raise hunting dogs and it doesn't have hunting drive, obviously you're not going to breed from, from that dog. Um, because you want you want your dogs to to excel, so you're not gonna you're not gonna you're not gonna spread those genes through you through the through the out in the gene pool. There's this term called selection pressure, and it's the the pressure that's put on uh, a, a group of organisms that decides who gets to which organisms reproduce in that in that in that population. Um, and it could be a bunch of different things. In, in, with pigeon racing, we control that selection pressure, uh, and. Just as a, as a whole, if we, you know, think of a, think of someone that's really well known in, in the racing community of having the best pigeons and the most sought after pigeons. Uh, and, you know, arguably on that list of names, Gannis is going to come up and, 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 you know, Mike has done phenomenal things in the pigeon sport. He's made uh, genetics available across the, across the, uh, the world to a lot of different fanciers, uh, especially here in the States. Um, um, good genetics. He's also a huge marketer and he's probably one of the best at it. He markets, markets his birds and you know you look at one of his pedigrees and a bunch of exclamation points and stuff's underlined and you just recognize that this is a pedigree from from Mike Gannis. That has put um, selection pressure on the pool of genes that are out there and so consequently a lot of people want GFL birds. They just They just want those birds because of, of, of the marketing, because people have had success with them. And, and so that, that, has, that has increased the gene pool uh, uh, for GFL birds, if, if that makes sense. And so the more GFL birds that are breeding, the more 
GFL birds that, that are going to be successful. There's a lot of GFL birds that are bred out there that aren't successful, um, but you hear about the ones that are. Um, I mentioned Cody um, in my last video, and he sent one bird to the Hoosier. The reason or the way that I found Cody is I went to average speed because that's really I, all I care about in results, especially at a one loft race because I want to see what birds are consistently at the top. And I went down that list and, and, and I came down to my first GFL bird and it was sent by, by Debbie Gannis. And um, I click on Debbie's name and it pulls up 27 pigeons. So 27 pigeons were entered under, under Debbie's name. Um, I went down and found Gannis Family Loft. It was down quite a bit further, but he was there on the list. 27 pigeons were sent in by Gannis Family Loft. So between between Debbie and, and, and Gannis Family Pigeons, there was uh, 54 pigeons that were sent to the Hoosier this year. There were 21 out of those 54 that were still there at the, at the last race, and about half of those came home. Um, they did have that one bird out of the, out of the, the 54 that was in the top you know, whatever, 30 and, and average speed, you know, and you would think with the, the, the way GFL birds are sought after, you would think that, you know, the, they, they would be a little more um, represented out of 54 pigeons sent in. You think they, they would be more represented. And I know there's all kinds of issues that go into this. And, and I, I don't, I mean, no disrespect to Gannis Family Loft. I think they've got great birds for sure. But when you pair two birds together, you're shuffling the deck. It's kind of a crapshoot. This, you, you, not not every hand is going to be a winning hand, even if it even if it's the best the best cock out there. Not every single pigeon out of that cock is going to be a good a good a good bird. That's just that's just kind of the, the, the way it is. You can definitely stack the deck, and if you if you put multiple winners in there, then then yes, you know you, 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 your your odds are are a little better than somebody that that had no winners in, in the background. Um, but again, some of this is marketing. Some of this is, uh, I don't like the term bread for stock. Um, you, look, you, you can look at pedigrees online at some of the auction sites and I almost want to look at a pedigree for a new guy. Look at a pedigree like a, like a, a resume. Uh, and if the parents were bred for stock and the grandparents were bred for stock and the great grandparents are, are some pigeons in there that actually performed, um, the odds of that pigeon after two generations of bread for stock is going to be a good pigeon are pretty low. Um, you, you really need to be breeding from breeding from performance birds. And I don't mean as a new, as someone new, this is just an idea. As someone new, I, I don't, I wouldn't recommend going to auction sites and buying pigeons. I would, I would recommend talking to local fanciers, getting to know the local people and, and getting help. Um, cause there's a, just a steep learning curve in, in this, in this sport. It's not overly complicated, but there's a bunch of different ideas surrounding breeding. I really think you would be better off and we would breed bed, better pigeons if we only bred from birds that performed. And that doesn't mean, I, I'm not talking about buying one loft winners. I'm not talking about club and combine winners. I'm just talking about the group of pigeons that you have in your loft. If you only bred from ones that performed, you would be better. Uh, you'd have better results. And if the selection criteria that you used was it had to be consistent in one of your first birds home in every race, and you only had two or three pigeons that you were breeding from, I think overall you'd, you, you would be breeding better birds rather than breeding from a bird just because it, it survived the young bird series and you just want to try it as a breeder. I hope, I hope that makes sense. I hope it's not offensive to anyone. Again, just a concept or idea, a idea that, I, that I have. I've had a great season. I've had a lot of fun. I appreciate everyone following along. Um, we do have some wild card entries that we're still gonna, we're still gonna pick from. Um, get a few more guys in, in the mix. I'm not gonna announce to those guys who they are probably till the first of the year. And I'm not gonna announce on YouTube who those wild card picks are until their birds show up. But I'm going to go ahead and sign off. You won't you won't hear from me for a couple months. Um, but then we'll we'll, uh, we'll 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 pick this back up when I start getting birds in the spring. If anybody has any questions about anything I've said or any comments, um, just put them in the put them put them down below, and I'll I'll do my best to answer them. Again, these are just ideas. Um, the overall arching theme is 
if you treated every bird like it was a $15,000 pigeon, I think you, you, you'll have more success. Um, and I, I, I hope that's clear and I hope that makes sense. Um, the only caveat to that is in the breeding side of it. If it, you buy that $15,000 bird and it, it doesn't do anything for you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't breed from it. Um, that, that's just, that's just me. Uh, take care you guys.